This is a BMW M5 from the E39 generation, which is BMW enthusiast speak for the M5 that was sold from 2000 to 2003. It's an icon, one of the greatest BMWs ever made. In my opinion, the greatest BMW sports sedan of all time. And today I'm going to review this car and show you what I mean. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my new online enthusiast car auction website located at carsandbids.com. We have a focus on modern enthusiast cars, stuff from the 80s and up. We have some amazing cars listed right now on Cars and Bids, like this, and also this and also this. So if you have a cool car from the 80s and up and you're looking to sell it and get top dollar, Cars and Bids is the place, the ultimate online marketplace for modern enthusiast cars. I've borrowed this M5 from the E39 source, which is a shop here in the San Diego area that specializes in BMWs, but particularly the E39 5 Series, like this car, which was sold from 1997 to 2003. They have tons of E39 parts and a growing service business, and you can check out E39 source by clicking the link in the description below. Now I'll start with a little overview. The 5 Series has always been BMW's mid-size sedan, slotting in their lineup between smaller models like the 3 Series and the full-size 7 Series. The M5 is the high-performance version of the 5 Series, and it came out here in North America for the 1988 model year. Early versions of the M5 had six-cylinder engines, but when the E39 generation of 5 Series came out for the 1997 model year, BMW decided to turn things up a bit. The M5 came out for 2000, and it had a 400-horsepower V8. That was a big number back then, and it only came with a six-speed manual transmission. An automatic wasn't even an option. The next generation of M5 came out for the 2000 2006 model year, and it had a V10 engine, which was awesome. But it also represented some big changes. For one thing, that version of the M5 didn't look as good as this car. The design was nowhere near as universally loved. Also, most of those M5s were automatics, and they used BMW's confusing iDrive system. Plus, as the years went on, it turned out that the next generation M5 was tremendously unreliable and difficult to own. As a result, many enthusiasts believe this to be the pinnacle of the M5, the last real M5 before BMW started focusing more on sales volume and crossovers instead of performance cars. And so, this M5 is an icon. And today, I'm going to review it. I've made videos with the E39 M5 before, but never really in depth. So today, I'm going to take you on a thorough tour of this car, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the E39 M5. Then, I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then, I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of this M5 with probably this car's biggest quirk, and that would be the owner. That's because this is probably the best preserved 20-year-old car I've ever been in. Not just the best preserved M5, but car. And that's because of an unbelievable amount of care the owner has given this car over the years. First proven by this amazing collection of accessories. Take a look at all these books and literature and shop manuals and magazines and model cars. Basically everything related to this car the owner could find he has, and it is a pretty impressive collection. The owner of this car even has the original VHS tape that was given to people who bought one of these new 20 years ago. I would kill for one of these for my Land Rover Defender, but I can't find it anywhere. Well, here it is in the original wrapping. But undoubtedly the craziest part of all this are these binders. These are all the car's service records in these three giant binders. 
Every single repair, maintenance, upgrade, change that was ever performed on this car is saved and laminated in these three binders. Now you open up the first binder and the first thing you find is the original window sticker and you can see that the sticker price of this car was around $72,000 back when it was new. Expensive then, obviously the M5 is far more expensive now. By today's standards, that 72 grand seems like a deal for an M5. But the more impressive item inside this binder is undoubtedly this spreadsheet with all of the services. This is every single service this car has ever had. Every repair, every part that went into this car is on this spreadsheet going back to 2000 when this car was sold new. Now this all may make it seem like the car is unreliable, but the owner told me it has never stranded him, never broken down on him ever. In fact, it's only ever thrown one check engine light while he was driving the car. Most of this stuff is upgrades, preventative maintenance, every Everything necessary to keep the car as perfect and pristine as absolutely possible, including a lot of upgrades and newer features for more modern BMW models. But anyway, we move on from this car's owner and its absolutely perfect ownership history. And we start talking about the quirks and features. I want to start with the key. To unlock the doors, you press the up arrow, which I think is supposed to simulate the door locks going up. Meanwhile, to lock the doors, you press the BMW logo in the center of the key and that locks the doors. After you've unlocked the doors, climb inside, turn on the car and there's a rather interesting quirk in the gauge cluster and that would be the red line. You can see it's at like 4,000 RPM. So what's that about? Well, when the car is cold, the red line shows lower so that you don't accidentally over rev it and damage the engine when it's cold. This red line actually changes as the car warms up. And you can see when it's fully warm, now the red line is where you'd expect it, around six, 7,000 RPM. So it has a variable red line to protect the engine. And the amount of revving you can do is actually shown with these little lights that sort of go off as the car warms up. Pretty smart. And Next up, moving further inside the car, we move on to the center where you have the cup holders, which are probably the worst cup holders ever created. You can see you just press this little panel and then they pop out, but they are incredibly small and incredibly flimsy and not deep enough. And I really wouldn't want to put any drinks in there. The Germans went kicking and screaming into cup holders. They couldn't understand why anyone would need to drink while they were driving along, but demands in other markets made it essential to put in cup holders. And this was kind of an early, first attempt. Maybe more interesting also in the center is the ashtray. Again, it's this little panel. You push it, the lid opens, but also the ashtray kind of rises up to make it easier to deposit your ashes in the ashtray. Not that the person who owns this car would ever think of smoking in it. To me though, the very coolest thing in the center console of this car is undoubtedly the gear lever. All right, right now it just looks like your typical manual transmission gear lever. The gears are on the top with the M logo, pretty standard, but get into a dark space, turn on the headlights and the gear lever actually lights up the top of it so you can still see the gears and the M logo. That is truly fantastic attention to detail. And I love that a lot of BMWs from this era have that. It just looks really cool when it's dark. And next up, another interesting item in the center console is the center storage area, which is actually actually just an armrest. There's no storage in there at all. This doesn't open. It does come forward if you want your arm to be rested a little further forward, but you can't open this up and actually store anything in here. An unusual decision in virtually every other car, this is storage. But for all the people who would miss their center storage, BMW has thought of you. You roll back the cover on this panel and there's a center storage area, much smaller than what you'd get in most cars, but it's something. BMW has provided a little center storage area since they didn't give you a big one. And for another interior storage item, how about turning your attention to the driver door panel where you see at the bottom this little black piece, push it and it opens revealing coin storage with coins perfectly placed in their rightful spots. Because in this M5, of course they are. Now, speaking of the door panel, one other interesting item here, the door panel has your driver's side climate vent. This is unusual. Most cars, they have the climate vent mounted on the dashboard piece next to the steering wheel, but not here. It's actually integrated into the door panel itself. And you can see it opens and closes with the door panel. And it's the same deal over on the passenger side. The passenger side climate vent is also integrated into the door panel. Should have been a very unusual design decision when this car first came out. I guess the thinking was with everything they wanted to put on the dashboard, they just 
just didn't quite have enough room to include the climate vents on there too, so they put them on the door panels. And now we move on to the center control stack where you can see this rather large screen in here. This was not original to this M5. Instead, this is from a later BMW model. The owner added it in. It looks totally stock, but the owner wanted some more functionality from a newer car, and so that's what it delivers, including Bluetooth audio, which obviously didn't come on this car 20 years ago. Now, this infotainment system was used in a lot of BMW models, and one interesting thing about it, if you press the eject button in the upper right, you can see the whole thing kind of moves down and tilts forward, revealing the cassette tape location. So if you want to play your cassette tape, press eject, and then the whole screen will do a little dance just so you can get your all-important cassette in there. Kind of interesting. And next up, another thing that I love in this interior is on the steering wheel. The stitching on the inside of the wheel is in the BMW M colors, and they alternate the colors throughout the entire inside of the wheel so that each M color gets its fair due. I really, really love how this looks. It's a nice piece of attention to detail that they do in a lot of the BMW M cars. And next up, also in that vicinity, you want to talk turn signal stock. You have this button at the end of the signal stock marked BC, and if you press that it changes the gauge cluster display to show various different pieces of information. You can see the date is on there, your average fuel economy, your trip mileage, all of that sort of thing. You just keep pressing that and it cycles through all the different pieces of information it can display. Now on the subject of that turn signal stock, I want to say the same thing here that I do every time I review a BMW from this era, which is this is the best feeling turn signal stock in the entire car industry. It just feels so solid, so perfect. It's not loose. It doesn't rattle when you touch it. It just feels absolutely like it should. This should be the model for every other turn signal stock. The feel, the solidness, it just is perfect. This is me geeking out over a very small thing, but I really do love the turn signal stocks and BMWs from this era. And in fact, you can generally apply that statement to pretty much every button and switch in this interior. It all looks good and feels good. Very much more solid and high quality than modern BMW models. Basically, everything you tap in here feels like it's of the highest quality possible that they could come up with at the time. And speaking of buttons, there is one rather weird button in here. In the driver's footwell, you have a button for the trunk. You can see it, a car with the trunk open. It's kind of an unusual placement for a trunk button. Usually, items in the footwell are latches that you pull, but BMW has put the trunk button in there too. And next up, since I mentioned the trunk. Let's move on to the trunk where there is a surprising number of quirks and features. Now to get back here, you can press that button in the driver footwell or press a button on the key fob or if the car is unlocked, there's a little electronic popper here and you can just pop it open. And when you get back here, you discover it is a rather large trunk, surprisingly deep for a car like this. It really goes pretty far back there, so you can get a lot of stuff in your M5 trunk. It's a practical sporty car. Now, another thing you notice right away when you open the trunk and look into the cargo area is my very favorite trunk diagram. On the inside of the trunk lid, you can see the illustration of three stowed golf bags, the back of an E39, and then where you're supposed to put three golf bags in order to get three into this trunk, because they thought that would be very important to buyers of this car. How can I get as many golf bags as possible back here? Kind of shows you who their target audience was. And next up, also on the inside of the trunk lid, if you twist this little fastener, you can open up this panel and reveal the toolkit. I've always loved the fact that the toolkit in these cars actually opens up like a table, so it's completely flat. So if you need to use it, your tools are just sitting there on display so you can easily access them and not add to the frustration of a roadside repair. A couple of interesting items in this toolkit worth noting. One is the road hazard warning triangle, which is in there, no surprise. You also have the wheel lock. There's a spot for that in there so you don't lose it. That is a really good idea. So many people put their wheel lock somewhere they can't figure out where they don't remember then it causes a problem this car there's a space for it and next up we move on to the back seat of the e39 m5 and the first thing you notice when you climb back here is 
there's not really all that much leg room. I have the front passenger seat in a fairly standard position. I'm sitting back here and I have room. My knees are right up against the seat. I can sit here, but it's not tremendously comfortable. You can't really lie back and relax or anything like that. It's a very different experience from what you get in a modern 5 Series. The car has grown so much and added so much leg room in back. This is the old school before they were really comfortable for all passengers. And next up, one good item back here. You have rear climate control vents and in the back it's not just the vents you also have a little temperature dial that you can use to change it from heat to cooler air it's rare you see that in the rear seat of a car from this era but the e39 m5 has it so that rear seat passengers can adjust their own climate experience and by the way, in the vicinity of those rear seat climate vents, you have more of the worst cup holders in the world. You push these panels and again, you can pop out cup holders, but once again, they are terrible, shallow, small, ridiculous, but they're there if you absolutely need to use them. Just don't count on them really holding your drink in place if you use this car to its full capabilities. One other notable rear seat item that the E39 M5 has is folding rear seats. You pull on this little latch and you can fold the seat down. Now, a lot of car companies have an issue with folding seats because when you fold the seat down, the headrest kind of will get caught on the front seat and then it's hard to fold it down flat and you have to remove the headrests. BMW came up with an ingenious solution to this problem. The headrest actually stays put when the seats fold. And so that way you don't have to take the headrest out when you fold the seat down or worry about getting it back into place and lining it up because it's always fixed in place on the rear shelf. That is actually really smart, and I don't know if I've really seen that in another car. One other notable item with the rear seats, you can see there's like a keyhole by the latch to lower the rear seats. That is so that you can lock the rear seats in place. And they do that because lowering the rear seats gives you access to the trunk and whatever you have in there. So if you're gonna give the car to a valet, use the master key to lock the rear seats, give the valet the valet key, and then they won't be able to fold down your rear seats. It's like an extra layer of security so the valet can't get into your trunk. And finally, we move under the hood in the E39 M5 so you can see the engine. This is a 4.9 liter V8, naturally aspirated, and it has about 400 horsepower. Again, that was a really big number at the time. This seemed like such a muscle car when it came out. Hard to believe how much that power number has been dwarfed by modern M5 models, but this was pretty much as good as you could do back in 2000. One notable item I like under the hood is this little label warning you to turn the lights off before you attempt any repairs in this vicinity, or else you could end up shocked like this guy who has like a little shock running through his body. That's how they've depicted that. Seems a little questionable, but I guess it gets the point across well enough. And finally, the last thing I want to discuss while I'm out here is how the E39 M5 looks. It's styling, because this car is really, really beautiful. For a four-door sedan, this was great. BMW sort of reached a pinnacle in this era, and I kind of feel like that's why later BMW designs had to be shocking and crazy with those crisp bangled designed rear ends that were so odd, because BMW had already done kind of the best they could with clean and simple and nice. And this car was really one of the best examples of that. A truly beautiful sedan, one of the very best BMW models or any cars from the late 90s and early 2000s. And so those are the quirks and features of the E39 BMW M5. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the E39 M5. I really, really love this car. I've always loved how it looks. And then I drove one for the first time uh, a few years ago and I just, I loved how it drove also, which is good. This car has a good clutch and shifter feel. Not something I always feel about BMWs. I feel like BMWs from later years, um, it just felt, the clutch felt a little too rubbery and a little vague, but this car had a great shift action. really fast. Even though this car has only 400 horsepower, it's fun to drive. It's really quick. It gets around. And for a 5 Series, which you now consider to be a large vehicle, um, it actually handles pretty well because, of course, 20 years ago, the 5 Series was a different sized car. 
I love how everything in this interior feels. The turn signal stock, famously, is, I love how it feels, but just everything in here just feels really solid and really well built. When I get into a modern BMW, a brand new model, um, it, it doesn't have this same feel to it. Now, new BMWs are focused more on technology, and obviously they're miles ahead of this car in that, um, but then the build quality is not the same as it always was. BMW has become more of a volume brand, more of a tech-focused brand, and the, the real ultra perfectly screwed together everything from cars like this is, is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. The driving experience of this car is just great. That's the thing. Ultimately, the, the whole driving experience is just great. Yes, there are modern cars that have better technology, that have more style in their interior. This one's kind of austere. But very few modern cars drive quite as well as this one. With just this solid feel where you just feel like it is unbelievably well-built, stable, planted on the ground. Um, and you can kind of toss around a, a, an M5. BMW has to do a lot of mitigating of the current M5's size to make it feel tossable. This thing, it just was like that because it wasn't very big. I'm also impressed with how responsive this car is, the uh, acceleration, especially in sport mode. Um, often sport modes are just kind of stupid. <laughs> they have no real function. Um, that's not the case with this car. You you put it in sport mode, you get on it, you can definitely tell throttle response has been tightened up, the car feels quicker. The speed and the steering and handling of this car is what makes it so great. It's, it's not extra fast. A new M5 is way faster, but maybe almost too excessively fast. Um, the new M5 is well over 600 horsepower. It's not really controllable or usable in any realistic setting. This car at 400 is kind of just the right amount, but also just the way it drives, the steering and handling, the feel of it is just perfect. It feels like an old glove that just fits perfectly. And that's something I have always truly loved about this car. And so that's the E39 BMW M5. This was a special car, and it's one that I really wanted as a kid. These came out when I was about 12, and at the time, it was the coolest car I could possibly imagine. And now, 20 years later, it's still really cool, and it feels like it's getting even more special as the years go on. Anyway, now I've already given the E39 M5 a Doug score in a previous video, but I'm going to revisit that score, see if I want to make any changes, and compare it to Rivals. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the E39 M5 is handsome for a sedan, really gorgeous, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Handling is reasonably sharp for a sedan from this era and this size, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is good. It's a fast V8 manual sedan that's really nice to drive, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is also good. These are cool, but they're also relatively common and fairly subtle. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 31 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This car was loaded back in its day, but it's only average by modern standards, a little below average, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is normal for a car like this, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is excellent. The interior quality is truly phenomenal, but these are known for some reliability troubles, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Next up is practicality. This is normal for the segment, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and these have become quite a bit more expensive since I last visited the E39 M5. Nice ones now routinely sell for well over $30,000, which is big money for an older sedan, even as good as this one is. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 28 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 59 out of 100, which places the E39 M5 here against relevant cars and the previous score for the E39 M5. It drops only one point in the value category just because prices of these have shot up so fast recently. Otherwise, it remains in about the same position, above nearly everything, because it's such a great car. No wonder it's becoming so expensive. Hey!